Okay, welcome back. We are in part two of memory one, and we're going to talk about memory as information processing as the first part of this. And then the second part, we're going to talk about the multi-store model of memory. And both of these follow some of the earlier historical research that we talked about in the first part. And just to uh, give you a temporal sensation, uh, we're talking about work that was done in the 60s, 50s and 60s, roughly. Okay, this is George Miller, and he's often considered a founder of cognitive psychology. He did early work looking at information processing limitations in people, and did later work on language processing. He's famous and or well known for a paper called The Magical Number 7, plus or minus two, some limits on our capacity for processing information. This review paper shows evidence that uh, absolute magnitude judgments in perception have similar information channel capacities. And then George Miller considers whether perceptual processing limitations also apply to memory. We're going to step through this paper. It's important to know about, and it connects with our previous learning module on information processing. Here's one of the big questions he was asking. One, are information channels for perception and memory limited in the same way or different ways? He reviewed evidence from perceptual judgments. This is a, uh, in particular, the absolute perceptual judgment task is a method from psychophysics. And here people are presented with one stimulus at a time from a set of possible stimuli. And they're asked to identify the stimulus with a name or a label. If you've ever heard of absolute pitch, this is the ability of some people to be able to hear a musical note and say exactly what that note name is. Um, it's pretty hard. Most people don't have that ability. I've got a little thumb piano here. So for example, what note is this? Uh, hopefully you can hear it. Anybody? How about this note? How about this note? If you had absolute pitch, you would be able to just say what the name of each of those notes was. For example, someone could uh, be blindfolded and someone else could be sitting in front of a piano and plus press any note on that piano. And that person would be able to say what the name of the note was. That's a very impressive ability. Considering there's 88 different keys on a piano, that's a very large set of stimuli. Um, okay, I'm using this as an example. Uh, because it can help us understand the absolute perceptual judgment task and how it progresses for a person. So this little thumb piano has, I don't know, not that many different notes on it. And this task could be pretty easy if I was just to say to you, okay, I'm going to pr present to you one of two notes. It's either going to be this one or it's going to be this one. The first one we'll call number one. And the second one we'll call number two. All right, now we're we ready for the test. Which one is this? Hopefully you could say number two. Which one is this one? Hopefully you could say number one. So with those only two things, people can do this pretty well. If you start having three things, for example, this one, one, two, or three, which one is this one? Which one is this one? Which one is this one? If you said one, two, three, you might have found that also fairly easy. So in this task, what people do is have, they're given uh, one of a few options and they have to learn to identify these things. But then the number of options start expanding. So once you get to like 10 or 15, I mean, I guess the question is how many uh, do you need to add? How big do you need to make the set size in order for people to start having a problem and performing poorly? 
Okay, we talked about absolute pitch here. Some results from uh, Pollack's experiment on absolute pitch judgments, just like what we were talking about. And Pollack presented people with sets of tones from 2 to 14 different tones and had people identify specific tones by naming them with a number. Now let's look what happened here. When there was two tones or three total tones or four, people were basically perfect at saying one or two or one, two or three or four or whatever. So they had basically absolute pitch when there's only four different things. But look what happens as you start increasing the total number of possible tones. People get worse and worse and worse. So this is around 14. If you have absolute pitch, you'd just basically be perfect the whole time. But most people don't have that, and most people get worse and worse and worse, just like we've seen here. Now, if you remember from last lecture on information processing, we talked about the concept of a bit. That's a unit in information theory. And we talked about how you could translate set size into numbers of bits. One bit can represent two things. Two bits can represent four things. Three bits can represent eight things. So all George Miller did here was translated performance in this graph, which has the number of tones in this set, to performance in this graph, which takes the number of items in the set and presents it as the amount of bits. Okay, so uh, as we increase the number of bits of information, at some point, when we have one bit of information, that's two things, or two bits of information, that's four things, there's a question, uh, how much information was transmitted and that's similar to the question about how accurate people are. And people are perfect on this line, but after the amount of information starts increasing, people go off the line and they kind of plateau. This dotted line here, indicating 2.5 bits, is meant to show the uh, channel capacity for making an absolute pitch judgment. In other words, people are pretty good up to about 2.5 bits of information. And that's around seven things. Uh, in this paper of George Miller's, we take a look, uh, or he shows that channel capacity is fairly similar uh, especially when you look at absolute judgments for different kinds of perceptual uh, stimuli. So instead of different pitches, you could look at different loudnesses of something. And you could have sets of things that, uh, in, you, you, instead of having lots of different pitches, you just have things of different loudnesses. And you could have two things or four things or eight things. And here we see a channel capacity of around 2.3 bits. You could have people drink little cups of water with different amounts of salt in them, and they'd have to say which, uh, which uh, they'd have to give a number for each cup to say how much salt was in it. So instead of pitch or loudness, it could be saltiness. And the channel capacity there is 1.9 bits. This one's kind of interesting. Uh, points on a line. So instead of different pitches, you could just have people try to identify points on a line. And the channel capacity there is 3.25 bits. Um, what about points in a square? Well, channel capacity goes up a little bit to 4.6 bits. If you look at pitch, loudness, taste, points on a line, these are all unidimensional stimuli, and the channel capacities were all around seven items, plus or minus two, which is the name of the paper, if you remember. 
Oh, I won't go back too far. All right. The interim summary was that judgments of absolute magnitude appear to be limited by stimulus set size. And that could be translated to the amount of information. Performance was typically perfect up to around set size of seven, plus or minus two. George Miller asked whether these uh, apparent principles would generalize to immediate memory span. So do perceptual judgment limitations also apply to your ability to remember information over the short term? Is there a relationship to immediate memory span? Now what's immediate memory span? This is a question about how many items your memory can hold over the short term. It's a way to measure the ability to encode and recall an arbitrary list of items over a short period of time. And it's well known that people can often retain around seven plus or minus two items. All right, if you want to test your own immediate memory span, let's do this right now. So what you got to do, I'm going to read out a list of numbers, okay? And just try to remember as many as you can. Don't write anything down just yet. I'm going to start right now, and I'm going to read out a whole bunch of numbers. One. Five, three, seven, six, four, eight, seven, nine, three, two, five, four, six. Okay, those were the numbers. Now, if you had a piece of paper or something like that, you're taking notes, go to the very beginning of those numbers and try to remember as many as you can in order. You can press pause, and if you want to figure out what, uh, if you want to test yourself and see how many you got right after you're done, I'll put the numbers up here. I didn't read them all out, but here they are. So you can start at the top and see if you got the top one right, see if you got the second one right, see if you got the third one right, and so on. As soon as you get one wrong, like let's say you got uh, these four right, then your memory span could be four. Or if you got all of these right, then your memory span would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so that's one way that we could measure how many things you can remember over the short period of time. And uh, when we do these kinds of experiments, we find that people can remember about seven things, or maybe sometimes four things, or maybe sometimes nine things, but it's around seven. And this is kind of suspiciously close to the channel capacity limits in absolute magnitude judgment. All right. Now, here is a, another aspect that makes uh, immediate memory different from perceptual judgment. So let's take a look at the relationship between immediate memory span and number of bits. This is a figure that was presented by George Miller. And in this figure, we're seeing number of items in memory span, okay? And for different kinds of stimuli, you might imagine or we just did a little test where I showed you decimal digits and had you try to remember those. But we could show people different kinds of things. So for example, I could have shown you a sequence of zeros and ones or a sequence of decimal digits. That's what I did show you. I could have shown you a sequence of letters or a sequence of letters and digits. Or I could have shown you a sequence of words and had you remember those. So. Um, if we think about this in terms of bits, there's only two things here. So the number of bits here is one. This one, there are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different symbols. So that's 10 different symbols. That's about three point something bits. This one, letters, all the different letters of the alphabet, that is 26 of those. That's four point something bits. Okay, so as we increase 
the number of bits in the thing that we're showing people, what happens to your immediate memory span? Does it change as a function of how many bits are needed for the individual items? Not so much. So we're looking at memory for lists of binary digits, decimal digits, letters, letters and digits, and 1000 words. That performance is plotted right here for each of those items. And it gets a little worse as we go out to the 1000 words, but pretty much what's happening here is performance is not changing a lot as a function of the information per item in bits. People's memory span is really depending on uh, just the number of items. So it could be a word, or it could be a letter, or a decimal digit, or a binary digit, it doesn't really matter what the thing is. Your immediate memory span is limited to about seven items, plus or minus two, it seems like. So what Miller suggests is that when it comes to immediate memory, people recode information into chunks and that immediate memory is not limited. Sorry, it's the, it's limited by the number of chunks and not the amount of information in each chunk. So for example, here's a way of thinking about what recoding means. If you were to get this sequence up top and try to remember it all, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, 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 zero. Try to remember that. You might get up to, up to here or up to there or something like that. However, you could recode these things in, into different units. For example, if you recoded from at a two to one ratio, this one zero refers to a two, this one zero refers to a two, a zero zero refers to a zero, a one zero refers to a two, a zero one refers to a one, a one one refers to a three and so on. If you made this conversion in your head, then you could be trying to remember a shorter sequence, fewer items. You'd be trying to remember two, two, zero, two, one, three, zero, three, two. So that's uh, for nine items. You might be able to remember that. And if you, if you could remember that format, um, then that could help you remember all of the ones and zeros. If you convert uh, using binary digits to at this five to one level, uh, this binary sequence would be a 20, this binary sequence would be a nine, and this one would be a 25. So for example, you could potentially, if you just had to remember 20, nine and 25, that's only three things. And if you knew this conversion recoding system, then you could remember what, uh, five, 10, 15 zeros and ones just by doing the recoding. So he suggests that people use chunking and recoding strategies in order to help them remember things in short term, uh, over the short term. All right, I've run out of time. I need to break and I guess I'm going to make this into three parts. So we just had a part on information processing and memory and in part three, come back for the multi-store model. See you then.